I love getting new watches. I'm someone who takes time to deliberate things, but this go around the watch took a long time to deliberate me. Well, enough of me teasing you like the rollicking sauce pot that I am. Let me show you this incredible one of a kind watch. Okay, so look, I know what you're thinking, but before you lay me to rest in the comments, I want you to check this out because this might well be one of, if not the coolest things to happen to me in my watch-centric life. So I'm sure you remember the launch of the Christopher Ward Bell Canto at the end of 2022 and the absolute storm it created, and my experience is particularly memorable. I'll be quite frank. At the time, I had no real interest in Christopher Ward. The watches seemed fine, but nothing really caught my attention, and I certainly didn't want a watch with the name of some bloke down the pub on the dial. So there I was, minding my own business, thinking of ways to analogise stuff like, um, a snail sitting in a garden or something, I don't know. And an email hits my inbox from a guy called Patrick, sent on behalf of that bloke down the pub. It's a long email, and so of course I read the first line the last line, and then I looked at the pictures. And then I double-checked that it was indeed an email from Christopher Ward, because the watch in the pictures was pretty mind-boggling, and didn't say Christopher Ward on it. There was a gong and a hammer, so it chimed. There was some complex mechanisms to make said gong and hammer get along nicely, which looked really cool. The architecture was symmetrical and interesting and didn't look like someone had blown holes in a steampunk robot, which is usually the case on this kind of watch. I was convinced this thing would come with an equally mind-boggling RRP, so I didn't bother getting my hopes up about the idea of owning a watch that looked like this, and then I actually saw the price. It cost the same as a Tudor Black Bay 58. There had to be a catch. Last time something like this happened to me, there was a Nigerian prince involved. I assumed, therefore, which as the old saying goes was about to make an ass out of you and me, that the effort had been biased in favour of the images, with skilled brushmanship whipping them into a frenzy of gleaming bezels and complex finishes. The actual watch, I surmised, would be the work of a fingerless scrap heap merchant. Patrick, convinced otherwise, sent a review piece in the post. It was about a week before the launch. That will be important later. This is where I have to hold my hands up and say, I was wrong. My cynicism got the better of me. There I was holding a watch in my hands that felt like it could cost 10 times the price, and it didn't. All that was promised was delivered. Well, we'll get back to that later too. Do you want to know something ridiculous? Like, dress it in a tutu and parade it around the streets ridiculous? The guys at Christopher Ward created the first blue edition in 300 pieces because they thought it would take them a year to sell. In terms of bad judgement, that's up there with that time the captain of the Titanic looked out at a sea of icebergs and thought, yeah, that'll be fine. I think those 300 bluebell cantos were gone in about an hour? Meanwhile, Muggins here was sitting there feeling pleased about the performance of his video on it when he realised he'd forgotten to put an order in. Actually, truth be told, it only occurred to me after the follow-up Green Dial version sold out even quicker than the blue. Because I'd only received the watch a week before, it had been such a rush that actually getting one had completely slipped my mind. Look, sometimes my brain doesn't think real smart, okay? M-O-O-N spells bel canto. Anyway, a few months later, and when Patrick sent through another email, this time about the, the 12, I had learnt my lesson, and upon trying it on, I bought one immediately. It seems unfair that I got to order one ahead of the general public, i.e. you, but sorry not sorry. I wasn't going to take any chances this time. I also very hesitantly asked if there might be any of the blue bell cantos left, if they could check down the back of the sofa or something to see if there were any they'd forgotten about. The answer was... No. No Blue Bell Canto for Little Andrew. They had the new series colours out, but to be honest, none of those really floated my pickle. Sorry Christopher Ward, I know you said the data told you those colours were good, but I think maybe you got that data from Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway? But they were generally in such a good mood about the whole Bell Canto thing that an alternate proposal was made instead. What about a custom Bell Canto? A unique piece? 
So I thought about that for a good 1.3 microseconds, and then I said yes. Obviously. Who wouldn't want a unique bel canto? The big concern was, how badly was I about to ruin it? Oh, by the way, for the record, I didn't like the green one either. Nothing against green, looks great on trees and stuff, but in every school I went to, four in total, I was always in the greenhouse. Red house was for the sporty kids, blue house was for the smart kids, yellow house was for the creative kids, and then the green house was for the kids who ate crayons. That was me. So, green was a no. But then I had an idea. Or rather, Richard Bentz from Studio Underdog had an idea for me, although he didn't know about it at the time. His series 01 chronograph blew people's minds by incorporating a little-known trait in watchmaking called fun. No more did collecting need to be a serious and important endeavour. You could buy a watch that looked like the inside of everyone's favourite fruity summer snack. The humble watermelon actually holds a lot of memories for me. When I was a kid, I hollowed one out, cut two eye holes in it, and wore it as a helmet. I was Watermelon Man. My head was very sticky. So that's what I decided to do, on a one British watch dude with the watch from another British watch dude by going for a red dial. I honestly couldn't believe they said yes to the red dial because I assumed they would want to make their own red dial in the future, but there we go. Warren and Faye said it was fine. If you look extra close, you'll see the chime indicator, or in my case, dog annoyance indicator since my dog hates the chime with an absolute passion. And here is coloured lime green, the watermelon's colourway counterpart. It's one of those if you know you know things, and now I guess you know. And so does Richard. Hi Richard! And as you're becoming accustomed to by now through the telling of this tale, I put the order in and then completely forgot about it. It was the great bel canto drought of 2023, when Christopher Ward realised that the suppliers they'd asked to make 300 in a year couldn't make thousands in a month. I heard more about this later down the line actually. The guys at Christopher Ward, stricken with panic at this heinous misjudgement, had to scramble to beg, borrow and steal any time from anyone willing to help them to make the parts for the bel canto. If you look, you'll see the laser cut gong has a black polished finish and the hammer and associated mechanism have polished bevels. This stuff has to be done by hand onto the machine made part and in the earliest days of the bel canto that was being done by literally anyone Christopher Ward could pin down. Some places could handle bigger batches, others just a few, and the outcome was pretty much as you'd expect, a mixed bag. The QC rejection rate at HQ therefore was high, and so there was this constant start-stop reset in the production line. It seems like they've got that all figured out now with a better consolidated process, but it took a sweet minute. Why am I telling you this? Because it took an even sweeter minute for my unique bel canto to turn up. All that was promised was delivered, eventually. It was so long I'd actually bought another The 12 for my wife in the meantime. I certainly don't begrudge that since it wasn't like it was just happening to me and of course mine had a different dial so I was willing to be patient and the reality is that I just kind of forgot it was coming. I can't stress this enough and it's not a joke, I can forget what a reminder was reminding me about in between seeing the reminder and clearing the reminder. I should probably go and speak to one of those, um, what are they called? Medical people? So when I got the call, so to speak, I have to say I was more chuffed than Thomas the Tank Engine climbing a particularly steep hill. And it was worth the wait because not only was it as good as I remembered, for whatever that's worth, it looked absolutely awesome in red. In some lights it goes very pale and pinky, kind of like the inside of a watermelon, and in others it's a deep red like an old postbox, which for you youngins is how we used to send emails. In the direct sun, not that I've seen that much of it since the watch arrived, it glistens like a freshly sliced grapefruit. If you've also just received your bel canto, you'll first probably be basking in sweet relief that it wasn't just an elaborately complex Ponzi scheme, and second, have started exploring its dingy secrets, trying to answer the ultimate question of every online purchase. Does this thing deliver in function what it does in looks, aka does it actually work? The premise of the bel canto is ingenious not just in its ability to offer a high-end complication at an affordable price, but also in the way that it does it. 
it's certainly not the first watch to offer a chiming complication at the affordable end of the market. The short-lived Tudor Heritage Advisor could be set as an alarm, but it does offer up some of the secrets of its operation. I say some because whilst the pusher activated on-off switch, striking hammer and laser cut lever connecting the two all sit neatly dial side, much of the mechanism is to be found underneath. It's actually the same mechanism developed for the jump hour previously created, which makes sense. In a jump hour watch, you need a mechanism that switches suddenly once every hour on the hour, and rather than using that sudden force to move an hour wheel, it can be used to strike a gong instead. Chiming complications first came into being in the 12th century as a way to provide a communal alarm clock. Clocks were just too big to fit in a house, so everyone in the town had to share. Because not everyone was staring at the clock the whole time, the strike of the hour and even the quarters provided an audible reminder that the residents should get back to being poor and disease-ridden. For the nobility, however, the chiming clock was the perfect way to get one up on that idiot of a man and his bore of a wife next door. It's a commonly held belief that striking and repeating complications existed to aid in the darker hours, but the reality is that the people who could afford them could also afford candles too. By the 15th century, the introduction of the spring to clockmaking had shrunk clocks down small enough to get through a front door, and so bored wealthy people would buy striking clocks to have at home just to show off to the neighbours. They'd have them round to subject them to the questionably pleasing sound of a bell, the whole while said neighbours would grin politely lightly through gritted teeth and wondered if they'd hear it through the wall. I have kept this tradition alive to this day by subjecting guests to obscure music at deafening levels on my hi-fi. There's a lot of carefully packaged laser cut spaghetti hiding behind the dial of the bel canto to make its striking mechanism all work. It adopts the same philosophy I do with my TV console and media storage. It's all feng shui where you can see it and an absolute cable salad where you can't. I believe some of this stuff is actually mounted to the underside of the dial itself, which even limits the depth of the sunburst graining on the front. That's the kind of packaging we're talking about here. Adrian knew he should ditch that tag hoyer and get one of these instead. It sounds boring to bleat on about packaging, but the Bel Canto is actually a masterclass in fitting many things into a tight space and still making it look good. It makes nesting dolls look like they're still practicing social distancing. The Grade 5 titanium case is actually 41mm across and 13mm tall, so it's not an incredibly svelte thing, yet somehow the numbers don't tell the whole story. Short lugs reduce the apparent diameter by bringing the strap inboard for a lug-to-lug -lug of 48mm, only a millimeter more than a Black Bay 58, and the bezel profile reduces apparent height by lowering the lugs, whilst all the gubbins inside get pushed up so close to the crystal there's barely room for a Nat's Tadger. Compare the height of the skinny Rehout versus the bezel, and you'll see what I mean. Chuck in a weight 30 grams lighter than a Black Bay 58, and it wears very comfortably, although may feel borderline too light for some without the optional bracelet. You get more of a sense of how this thing works as you wear it and realize that, over the hour, the hammer gets further away from the gong. In the first 20 minutes or so, it's still close enough that turning the chime on and off will cause the hammer to strike and the gong to chime, but as it moves further away through the hour, turning it on and off yields only silence. And when you don your inner jeeves and peer through the keyhole at the centre of the dial, you'll get to see how it all works. There's a snail cam, which kind of looks like an infilled number 6, that turns once per hour. You can see as the cam profile gets taller, it pushes a finger follower which in turn lifts the hammer. When the snail cam profile reaches a full rotation, gets to its peak and drops, that allows the hammer to leap, thanks to the springs on the intricately cut lever, back to its original position, where it overextends, strikes the gong, and upsets my dog. You can even see the consideration for setting the watch backwards, where the little cam follower finger levers out of the way on a tiny spring, so it doesn't jam up the movement. So what kind of voodoo witchcraft is going on to be able to make the Bel Canto the same price as a Tudor Black Bay 58? First, it's the margin, a three times markup to which Christopher Ward resolutely adheres. Since co-founder Mike France came from a retail background and that's what he was used to, that's to what he sticks. For most other luxury watch brands, that multiplier starts at 5 times and usually gets closer to 10. But that only gets us so far. The real story of the Bel Canto is in its ability to distract. This is smoke and mirrors territory, sleight of hand at its finest, where Christopher Ward picks and chooses where to spend money to deliver impact, and where to save it to reduce cost. 
The movement, for example, is a basic Celita SW200, shrouded with a solid case back. The FS01 chiming module is where you can't see it and in some places where you can, laser cut and definitely where you can't see it, left unfinished and raw. To me that makes a lot of sense. Yes, they could apply the most delicate finish to the nether regions of the watch, but why? So you can spend all that money for no tangible benefit? No thanks. I already got my degree. Okay, so it is nice when you know the watchmaker gave every last part a hug and a kiss and read it a bedtime story before tucking it away into the movement, but that stuff is prohibitively expensive and would have gone against the entire ethos of the bel canto. Just like we all promise to do after every big watch purchase, the real secret of the bel canto is sensible budget management. The leather strap that comes on the watch isn't the best. It reminds me of when you step on a slug and it dries on the bottom of your shoe. It's kind of thin and tacky and is, compared to the incredibly elevated feel of the rest of the watch, a very obvious area of cost saving. They call it Vacona leather, which is, according to the manufacturer, produced on big South German bull hides, with healed wounds, veins and insect bites contributing to the exclusive look of the leather. That reminds me of a South German car I once bought that boasted the exclusive look of stone chips, wall scrapes and trolley dents. No sweat though, as that's something very easily swapped out thanks to a standardised 22mm lug width. I haven't actually tried the bracelet since I personally think it suits the watch like a crop top would suit me. If you have the £3,195 for the Bel Canto, not this one in red obviously, that's mine and you can keep your filthy paws off, or the £3,530 for the Bel Canto on the bracelet, what would you realistically be considering instead? I've compared it to the Tudor Black Bay 58 in terms of wearability and comfort because they're almost identical in price and the Black Bay 58 is more comfortable than that one guy who takes his shoes off at the office. But otherwise they've got as much in common with each other as literally anyone running for government and since. If you want the chiming function, you'd have to look at a used Tudor Heritage Advisor at around £4,000, but that won't give you the swish looks. A Chopard Tech Strike 1 has both, but that's, if you can find one, the thick end of £15,000. The same root mechanism is to be found in the Fears collaboration with Christopher Ward, the Alliance 01, which sold for £4,000 and is now all gone. Perhaps if you want to go down the boutique stylings of MBNF and Orverk and don't mind it a bit rougher around the edges, you could try Xerix Artemis Tumblr at closer to £1,000. Really, and this is kind of the Bel Canto's party trick, if you want to watch like the Bel Canto, there is only the Bel Canto. It's not all ham and eggs though, because the astonishingly low price that brings you all the Bel Canto's good bits does leave you with a few not so good bits. The strap appears to have come from the cow in Starship Troopers. The case at 30 meters water resistant couldn't be more averse to moisture if it had rabies. The movement, being a Bogo Salita SW200, gets a lousy 38 hours of power reserve and a measly plus minus 20 seconds per day accuracy. In reality, the accuracy is more based on a possible range set by the factory, and mine has been a lot better than that, but it's not much of a commitment. The power reserve is really only good enough to last you the night and simply can't stretch to two, which means putting the watch on a winder or wearing it on your ankle in the meantime. And there's perhaps a couple of quirks, rather than negatives, but worth mentioning anyway. The mechanism for getting the cam follower finger out of the way when setting backwards doesn't reset until about 40 minutes ahead of the hour. So if you only need to set the watch back a little bit and you have to cross the hour to get there, you'll need to go back a little further and then set it forwards again, otherwise that first hour will go without a chime. You'll also notice on occasion, and I think this is to do with the jump power mechanism affixed to the back of the dial, that if you indirectly knock the watch by bumping your arm or hand, you'll hear a hollow discordant chime in there that's like it's haunted by the ghost of Quasimodo. One nice to have, and this is pickier than my wife at a restaurant whilst the waiter is really living up to the job title, would be for the motion works, the wheels straddling the hands to convert minutes into hours, to be finished a little nicer. Everything else is so tip top and those are just missing a cheeky little bit of radial brushwork that would really be the cherry on the cake. If the cake were the size of a coin and the cherry almost invisible. 
I don't think it's going to be any surprise when it comes to the parts I do like. I love the look of this thing, especially in this colour, which is just for me and not for you, and don't forget it. I would do bad things to good people for an MBNF Legacy Machine LM101, and so the existence of the Bel Canto is for me mana from heaven and a life out of jail. Tesco value mana, but mana nonetheless. The fact that it's not all show and no go is even better. It actually goes ding every hour on the hour, so long as you haven't taken it off for more than five minutes and let the power reserve run down. And even though the noise ding is a noise you can just make with your mouth, ding, the fact you can have a mechanical device that ushers in the time like what the rich people did in the olden days is just fantastical. Ding. Throw in a dashing of hand finishing, just here and there to get the point across, and it's a watch that, uh, yes, just £3,195, offers an experience I am yet to find anywhere else at that price. Within watchmaking, I mean. £3,195 could get you a pretty good experience elsewhere. What's your take on the Bel Canto, and how jealous on a scale of 1 to I'll knife ya are you of my unique red one? For me, this watch is not only the first I've owned that's been created just for me, but also marks the start of this new chapter in my life too. One day I'll be looking at it, think back and smile. Or if everything's gone belly up, I'll be hoping it's worth a decent amount on eBay. Anyway, thanks for watching, and thank you to my Patreons. Look, there they go for helping me to make this dream a reality. Thank you for watching, take care, and in the meantime, don't forget to chew gum really loud with your mouth open. They'll love that. Goodbye.